Okay, so welcome to the to this BOF session on everyone's favorite topic, Linux CVs. Um, I mean, I think we all are pretty much familiar with what's going on, but just wanted to have a quick, uh, uh, quick introduction slide so that we are on the same page. Um, so yeah, since February 2024, uh, Linux is now its own certificate numbering authority, so it can uh, issue CVs. Uh, I've, I'm putting a link here to a presentation that Greg gave us uh, a couple of weeks ago at uh, CNCF. Where is Greg? Uh, he is around, by the way. Uh, so thanks for being here. Uh, so, yeah. Um, this is, I think, the most up-to-date uh, uh, resource if you want to know a bit about what's going on under the hood. Um, but yeah, so w the reason why we're here, uh, I think, is to try and get uh, a bit of discussion happening between the people who need to uh, deal with the uh, increase the CV volume that uh, we have to uh, that we have seen, uh, we were receiving around 20 CVs per month before this change, and now we are around 60 per week. Uh, I know we have opinions. I know pe some people here have also strong opinions, but I think the point is not exactly trying to stay too much on this number, but try to uh, adapt to them. Um, so I think. Like the main challenge that we have here, yeah, is how to triage all of these CVs. And there's companies who cannot be uh, upstream aligned, who need to take decisions based on uh, the severity of these CVs. Uh, for a cloud provider uh, like Google, I did introduce myself, but I work for Google. I uh, work for the production kernel security team. We need to choose whether we care about a commit, uh, whether uh, we care a lot about it, so that we also need to live patch some machines on the fleet or whether we can maybe even ignore it because we don't even compile the code, right? And applicability depends a lot on the threat model and on whatever deployment you run Linux on, but there is also obviously some common points where we can perhaps have some collaboration going. Uh, so here I have three ideas. They are probably wrong and uh, I'm hoping you will destroy them, but at the same time they can you know, get the discussion started and they're also not mutually exclusive or perfect or anything. But like one idea we came up with, one first potential approach is um, kind of trying to address uh, a layer that is missing right now. Because we have uh, the stable, uh, stable guys who are giving us a lot of CVs, and then we have the uh, companies downstream that try to do something with them. And there's a layer missing in between that is providing the severity, reachability, some kind of assessment um, that uh, right now nobody is doing, and every company is doing it. But that's uh, apparently uh, a bar that is too high for someone to just take care of it, and they tend to prefer to just yeah not care. So that's kind of how it worked forever, though. Now. Like yeah, exactly. Now. Yeah. Because we will revoke it. We don't have a web form like Reddit. Sure. Or you couldn't do it. Just email us. If you don't want it, we'll reject it. Yeah, and this is it's great that this is possible but at the same time it requires someone to context switch go back to that old commit they did a few weeks ago and sort of revisit it so the the idea here and again i acknowledge that this would uh, uh, mean probably spamming uh, you know uh, patch authors and they're probably not gonna like that is uh, yeah so yeah, this is exactly what I was hoping for. Yeah, so, we, so this has come up numerous times for the record. Um, we've talked about it a lot. We will not spam authors or maintainers that they got a CVE for that patch. If they want to, they can. it's easy to filter. You can put up a LEI filter and see what you get because we publish all this stuff. You can put a JSON thing on the feed. Um, if you care, you can be instantly notified that way, but we will not be spamming through email other people because we get too many emails as it is. Yeah. But this happens afterwards. You see, you see, you see what I'm trying to say. Here, right? I, I totally agree. It happens yeah. afterwards, but we, it would be happening afterwards when it would be when the CV assignment happened. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So. Yeah. And I think the CV assignment also from a maintainer perspective. Can we give KP a mic? It, it is very threat model. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> First, maintainers are burdened, right? They, it's it's hard for them to get to all of this. Nobody, not everybody is a, a security expert, so they may not have so, the right uh, yeah. sort of view on that. And the third thing is uh, uh, there's a very fine line between CVE and bug, right? 
So I think the main point here is that you have to look at every patch, as Case mentioned earlier on. Yeah. So I, I, I think I think what we need is community attention side of things. The people who are consuming these uh, consuming Linux to look at these patches and find out for their threat model is this patch relevant, important, and then prioritize. Uh, it's not. By the way, it's not necessarily about uh, I want. Uh, I, w I, I want or I don't want a CVE for my commit. It's also perhaps about providing a, even like, uh, I mean, really thinking out loud here, but even like a better commit description or some tags in the commit description that says this code is network reachable, right? So at least you know, you know, you, maybe you're a net maintainer, you know, right? I know. I know. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> Maintainer of a subsystem, there's no way I could do that. And I would never ask a maintainer to do extra work. Okay. And you're asking the most precious re overworked resource that we have to do more work, and that's not going to fly. Yeah. Already we have the rule that you don't have to participate in stable. We discussed maybe we want to revoke that at last week or a few days ago, but there's no way we're going to tell somebody to do this, especially when we have a really overworked ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I was aware of And this. the only people that care about this are the downstream, a subset of the downstream. Yeah. So it's up to you to do that. Do you think there's any scope for deciding on an opt-in format or, or, or standard or mechanism for patch authors to include information about, like, I'm fixing a bug here. I happen to know that it can only be exploited if the attacker has capnet admin. That's change log. That's a change log description. Okay, but better change log description. Better change log description. It's there. You okay. Have that today. Uh, but do people some very do occasionally do it. Um, some do, some don't. Yeah. That's up to them. Okay. Uh, the way is education, right? You have documentation that you can point to, present here, like, hey, you're writing a patch description. Uh, patch description. This would help security people. It's opt-in. Uh, but you, you cannot enforce that, right? But if, uh, yeah. I'll just give it. Well, I mean, while, while a lot of this is a pain in the butt for downstreams, we, there's, there's a problem with end users and consumers in some aspects, though, that we're, we're having to deal with now that there are companies, for compliance reasons, that have to patch every published CVE whether it's exploitable or not, and that's becoming a, a bigger problem. And analysis is great, but I mean, even if the analysis says, well, oh, it's a low priority, people are having to patch it for compliance. But that's not right. <laughs> so I think this is where the compliance side of things, right? Are, are, are we giving our, is the, is the compliance regulation being done in a way that gives you a false sense of security? Because you, you, you have 20 CVs a month. Now, you see syscaller bugs and UAFs that were not awarded a CV <coughs> actually being exploited. So maybe the compliance has to catch up there, right? We need, to tell, we need to tell people that your idea of these CVEs that were actually being exploited or being, it's, it's changed. Every patch needs to be reviewed. I'm saying the compliance rules are correct. Yeah. Um, but, but they exist, and so the, the work... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't agree with a lot of the compliance rules there. I, I don't think that they're correct. They're not, I mean, it, it's it's just like in pretty much any other government document on security compliance, right? It's, it's a whole bunch of nothing. Um, but they're required. And, and so you're still putting work on all of these, these companies. I think it's, it gives them more reality to the compliance. So there is an issue with the number of CVs are going up at an exponential rate. We are not alone. WordPress is doing 200 a week. GitHub's doing 150 a week. Mitra's issuing 500 a week. OSX, uh, Windows is doing 10 to 20 a week. We are not alone here. So that's a different ecosystem question that the CVE board knows about and that it's up to them to work on. It's not up to us to work on. Um, and I always try to get people to think about what, what the actual, you know, what we're representing. CVs were supposed to be a stand-in for flaws. And so the real world situation we want to deal with is addressing flaws. CVs are just a poor mapping to it. And in the past, we had effectively uh, false negatives. We had a huge number of flaws that had no CV mapping. 
and we've traded that now so that we have false positives, but few false positives. Um, the compliance was designed to say you have to fix flaws. And so the, the problem now is companies that couldn't fix flaws before that had flaws because they were just not assigned CVEs have to now fix the flaws. So it, it, it actually is the correct state and the, 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 the sort of whiplash on dealing with, oh my God, all these CVEs is the realization that the, there is an outstanding number of flaws <laughs> and that all the companies that are feeling that pain, uh, unfortunately, now need to figure out, oh, I, I, we actually have to fix the flaws. So anyone that says we can't keep up with the CVEs are declaring to the world, we can't keep up with the flaws that are in here. That are being fixed. That are being fixed. And so like, I, I think CVE is a weird, like it, it has created a problem for a lot of people because that was the attachment that was made. But honestly, for the actual deployments that we all care about, we want to fix the flaws. So that, that's the real key to this. Yeah, and I think the way you fix the flaws and the way you uh, sort of do your qualification, your updates, and your deployment of the kernel has to has to adapt to this, right? The the twenty patch, which results in one or two fixes every month, uh, that mechanism has to change. The way this has to change is where why we're all here. Well, I mean, I'm I'm Fedora, so I'm pushing every stable update, but once twice a week. That's fine. I mean, it, it's not a lot of people there. Oh yes. Uh, I, I mean, yeah. I let you finish. Then I I would have. And point. Oh, yeah, go ahead. yeah, I was just, I mean, from, from my standpoint, it, we're already pushing the, the stuff anyway. So it's, in fact, it's basically just some extra work for me to go back and say, oh, yes, that release I pushed last week fixed all of these CVs. Not a big deal. But, um, I mean, I, we do hear about, you know, people complaining about the number of, oh, well, we've got all these CVs, we've got to now reboot. And that's just passing that on. <clears throat> yeah, which is why I... I was hoping not to go too much into the number of CVEs as an issue by itself. Like, that is what it is. And uh, frankly speaking, again, if we want to talk about our opinions, I think this gives a better picture of what the security of the kernel than what it was given before. So we talked about false sense of security. I, I actually agree with that a lot. So let's talk about how we deal with this, not about changing the numbers. We all feel the pain, right? Tamiano and I work on kernel security at Google. We get these CVEs, we look at them. All of this analysis is happening siloed within various corners of the industry. We just need to do what we do best, open source it, right? The analysis need to be open source and, and we can tackle this. We tackle Linux as a development project, as a community. This can be tackled as well, I think. So I want to point out, yes, and the CVE.org allows for overlays on CVEs in the JSON format to allow for an analyst. They've already approved two different companies to do this. If you watch the Git tree from CVE.org, they hit all of ours. Every single CVE got hit with this template change. Um, you guys can do that. We can add the analysis to the JSON record if you provide it to us. We have the tools for it. I'm more than willing to do that, and CVE.org is very happy to have that. So there's no, no pushback from me on this. And the infrastructure's there to provide this in a public way, if you can give it to me. Yeah, sure. So give it to me. <laughs> um, so a couple of years ago, uh, me and a few others from the Arch Linux security team, we, we sent out sort of an open letter to a bunch of the product security teams and CVE teams in different Linux distros. Uh, so we made this RC channel called Distro Security, uh, which had this intention of sh sort of sharing analysis and sort of CV assignments around the Linux kernel because all of SUSE, Red Hat, Arch, again, to all of us do sort of the same analysis, the same sort of which patch do we need to backport and stuff. Um, so that's a venue we could maybe do more open collaboration on. Uh, it sort of lost a little bit of steam uh, a couple of years ago because CVs are difficult, but the RC channel still exists, uh, and there's still people there sometimes talking about different CV assignments. So I think the open collaboration thing could maybe fit in that venue, and I, we could uh, go and ask the different people there what their thoughts on this is. Yeah. 
So, so I, I don't think the open collaboration is is possible because to triage a CV, you have to have a use case, right? You can't just globally triage a CV. Depends if it's like an enterprise distro, if it's an airplane, if it's that friggin' helicopter on Mars, right? They, they're all very different. And, and so this is why, like, the, the next idea is giving some context to how we, like, we care only about things that affect cloud. And that's a group that could, could triage. And then they could add it to the JSON and say, hey, this is all the... the cloud consortium and we, this is how we score the CV. Or this is the enterprise distro folks and that they, this is how they score their CV. But, but you can't have like this global CVSS score attached to a CV, right? I agree it can't, it can't be global, but I agree also, I also think that there are some things that are common to everything, right? So uh, if, if you, you, you don't think so. I don't think so. Stuff like um, the CVs that are assigned to Warren, like, right? Like, they might affect Android devices because they reboot them, but if your distro doesn't have panic on warn... So, you, you actually picked the right example. So, we don't care about warnings. What? So, if you, could, if you could label a CV as a warning, no, for no, us, no. it would be no. very valuable because no, no, no. there, there will be something we can no, discuss. No, no, so the, the problem is if a warn can be triggered... No, 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 I, I know. Some people yeah. care, but well, no. some don't. I agree. So, that's a, I mean, that's very obvious in the, C, in the thing itself. So provide that information. It but, depends but, why the warning was triggered as well. It depends on why. So sometimes those warnings are actually an indication yeah, yeah. of a well, real well, issue. What, what I'm trying well, to say is that yeah, well, yeah, sorry. If, if a warning is only problematic on panic on warn uh, deployments, those who don't have panic on warn can... But I, I'm saying, yes, and that involves a lot of triage. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and a use case. <laughs> we, we, we're switching. I mean, uh, that now case. zero one is quantum state. But I mean, I, th I think what you're talking about is if we had a machine readable form of describing characteristics for a given CVE, then people in idea one uh, can apply their threat model to those characteristics to get yep. the information they need yep. and maybe add further information. So that, that I mean, I think those combined make Absolutely. sense. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cengiz from Ubuntu Kernel Security. Uh, I'm still wondering why we are not actually I know it's not designed for kernel per se, but we are not actually providing real CVSS assignments to kernels, right? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I know you have. Like... We're not required to, and we're not told to, and I don't know your use case. It doesn't matter. There's a very good quote on a bug is nothing to you, something to you, and it's deadly to them. I can't give you a CSS. And my and NIST, who's doing the my, who's doing the, the add-on? Yeah, my, maybe, yeah. Maybe. Oh, they, they've given up. Uh, no, that would be NBD. NBD, yeah. There's no way you cannot do. It just doesn't work. So we are not basically using the description field. Well, y you guys, it, you know your use case. I don't know your use case. <laughs> I've already triaged this for you. Yeah, it's up to you to do the next part. Okay. <laughs> I think what Sasha said is pretty good, right? have few common threat, few common threat models, describe them cleanly in the JSON for each threat model to your assessment, add some common tags, which somebody who hasn't put their threat model can use, and here we go, right? Um, no problem with that. Yeah. yeah. So this is kind of fun with the It's not only because I worked in a cloud company, like if I work with some yeah. cloud company. Like, so this is why we can't give CVSS scores, because score for canonical will be different than the score for what I'm working on now, right? You can't score that. Yeah. But, but if you define your use case, if you say canonical, Fedora, like all of those groups kind of do something similar, have a similar threat model, you can score them. And it can go into CV, like it'll go to the JSON. Yeah. And, and you can say, hey, we scored this a 7.0. And you can share it with your customers. Like the infrastructure is there already. We don't need to invent anything. I'm asking the infrastructure you're talking about this ADP, uh, additional data provider for CVE layers. Yeah. yeah okay. So, but, oh, oh, yeah. oh, sorry. <laughs> we do have ADP additional, but we are the data provider, and there's a ton of fields that we can just give this information in as the data provider. You, if you guys want to just form a, your own group and be an ADP on its own, that makes my life even easier. We don't have to do anything, and you have right right, right access to our records. But otherwise, we can provide this too. There's so many fields we're not using. When I was saying CVSS, of, of course, I was not, you know, defending the use case of CVSS. But for me, like as, this, as the consumer of this, like I have to have a quick glance, a, 
like some keyword table maybe even, hey, this is net filter. Yeah, it might end up a user after free. Hey, and it doesn't, like it can be triggered by user namespaces, right? That's so. That's yeah, we already do with our own scripts, but I don't want to go for the fully parsing this full text script again and again, because sometimes words change and I mean, my model is not that flexible, That's so. Yeah, so. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, oh, I guess uh, for the record then, yeah. As a distros, we've got the same problem. We don't know what our customers are using our distro for. They could be using it for anything. Uh, but we do need to give them some information that helps them determine whether or not they, they need to apply this this fix. Yeah, which is why I don't think either the CVSS score is a particularly um, meaningful metric. Uh, it's highly dependent on the deployment, as we said, but some perhaps uh, yeah, different tags could be, right? I, if it, yeah, like the ones uh, changes talk about, for example. I think, uh, Brendan or Greg? I do want to point out for the record that um, all the hardware bugs, like Spectrum Meltdown and any other hardware issues, do not get a CVE from us, and they do not get tagged by us, and they do not get notified by us. That's up to the hardware vendor, and that is a huge hole, and you need to take it up with the hardware vendors. Um, so that's something that everybody is missing in this whole thing, because we have had a lot of Spectra fixes over the past six months, and they just cruise by everybody. Nobody noticed. That wasn't good. I mean, CPU bugs, yes, they're <laughs> complicated, right, KP? Yeah. One problem at a time, folks. <laughs> <laughs> specific, but I'm, I'm curious about the uh, distro kernels. Uh, what are the cases where, so you said you kind of have the same problem as stable, right, which is that you don't know what your users are doing with the kernel, but you said that you have had some, like in the past, some process where you're able to distribute information that users can be downstream of. What, what, like what are the cases where they don't want to apply the patch and how do you identify that for them? Uh, I mean, you've, you've got, uh, I don't do live patch for Fedora. RHEL does live patch for, for certain things. But uh, does a user want to reboot? Um, you know, if it's something that is only exploitable by a local user and it's a system that has exactly one local user, they may not want to. Uh, there's not a reason to. Um, it's, it's bits like that. Sure, there's vulnerabilities on the system, but uh, it's do I have to patch these now or do I patch these next month? And it depends on my use case. Um, we've got users who are using, I mean, look, on the Fedora side, everything from HPC to phones. Uh, you know, it, it's it's all over the map. So I have no idea what they're doing. Uh, but we at least should let them know, is this something that's locally exploitable? Is this something that's remotely exploitable? Does it require certain privileges, anything like that, so that they can make that determination themselves? How do you give them that information at scale, or do you just do that and have them read everything. Uh, on the Fedora. Fedora side, I really don't. Um, <laughs> I just attach. Prodsec does a lot of that work for CVEs uh, that, that apply to RHEL. Um, a lot of the things that, that apply to Fedora, because we build a lot more drivers and things like that, don't necessarily apply to RHEL. So it's like if we get that for, for free because they're doing that for RHEL, that's great. Uh, if we don't get it, uh, I mean, I can only do what, what the upstream sources are, right? <clears throat> this is this again sort gets solved with the threat modeling exercise. You can describe the more the threat model with certain cat categories, right? Cloud threat model is effectively untrusted code virtualized, right? Uh, a single user system, right, is is another threat model that you folks have. A cellular automobile, you can have all these threat models and then assess the CVE separately for that. And there are separate separate big chunks of people in each threat model who are, who would be hopefully willing to contribute there, right? And then it becomes a very rich assessment of the patch, which I think was the original intent of this CVE thing. Okay. Oh, God. 
I think it will be interesting to m sort of map where the fix happens and what are the chances of this being related to certain threat models. That would be really interesting because that could be automated. You guys do realize the rate of change here, right? <laughs> so, I mean, this is, this is high volume. So for you guys to keep up, uh, I wish you luck. What's just keeping you from taking everything? Stability. Then what is broken in your testing to prevent that? Sometimes it gets missed that we, like, as Google, for example, we take everything, but applying, we have to remember that applying a fix to, applying a commit to a repo isn't fixing anything, right? Um, so sometimes that's not anywhere near enough, and we need to like have op an operational, organizational response, and that's the thing that we're most interested in figuring out, right? But, I mean, from my kernel.org security position, I, I know we have major security things fixed every week <laughs> that are now getting CVEs, and I swear three quarters of this room will not notice. That's not good, but I can't tell the world but I'm now telling you with a CVE, don't ignore that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what Brendan said is like, I, I agree that being closer to stable is the way to go. I mean, of course, if you can, but if, if you can't reboot machines, that's problematic. Yeah, and there's some people that physically can't reboot every two weeks. Yeah. I, I understand, it's fine. I mean, that, that's physical limitations that you guys can work on. Android has its issues. but. I mean, this is my worry, because I know, I know what we fix, and we watch, I mean, just watch the 60 a week. Review it, give us help. I would love, we would love help in reviewing and triaging these and finding them ourselves. We take help, and we do this all in public, too. You can see what we're reviewing in public ahead of time before we give the CVEs. Help us. The organizational response we, we take here, or the, or the, is the fact that we, deal with, it, with code provenance. We don't want untrusted code running without two layers of isolation, right? That's one way to eliminate a large quantities of bugs. So you focus on networking and you focus on KVM boundaries, and that narrows your lens a little bit, and you live patch these. Uh, but that's, that's, not, that's not everybody's model, so that's a, that's a, that, that, but hey, for Google it works. <laughs> So uh, I don't think that's true for the clouds, for example, but for some distro users, I think the duration that we have for the stable trees are not long enough sometimes. Again, today you might have some distro users, for example, they prefer to stay for five years or more with the same version. Many times and publicly, there's a whole web page. If you want an LTS to go longer than two years, talk to me and provide the resources, and I'm glad to do this. In the past, that's what's happened. I'm not the one doing this six-year stuff. Google is paying Lenaro to do this work. Google has stepped up. Now, with the new laws and the changes in the way mobile works, they don't have to support them for six years anymore, so they're going to back off this stuff. So if other people are relying on this, step up, and you, if you want it, I have the infrastructure for you to help. I'm not, I'm not in this alone. <laughs> But realize, the older the kernel, the more work it takes. And I will argue, people on those older kernels don't really care because we have known major security bugs that are not fixed in them, and it's public knowledge, and nobody seems to care. That affect almost all these, these use cases. So nobody's caring about that. I will call Android for actually caring and do backport it. But Android, again, so 60 a week, I did a math, four. It's averaging four a week for Android that affects their systems. And actually, that's better than iOS. iOS is five to, five to eight. So look at your model. Um, one, one thing I've talked with some people about is uh, being able to pick which is more work or less work is what you want to go after. What's less work is um, examining every flaw f against your threat model or fixing why you can't use stable. <laughs> and if you don't want to have flaws, that's the choice to make. Mm, I, I think the, <laughs> I think the, we, were, we use stable, but the, the, the 
reboot and update cadence becomes an issue. So we need to look at everything and see what affects more. So, so why do you need to reboot? Why do Sorry, why can't you reboot? Uh, That's what I mean is, what is more work? Doing that piece or I, fixing the process? I, I, like that, that's, that's I think both. Both are complicated problems, right? right yeah, and no, and you tackle it with both. Uh, uh, Neither are easy. <laughs> if you're cherry picking individual um, fixes, you still have to reboot. No, no, no like that. Like that. that works with everything? Almost. Okay. <laughs> okay. So what I, I, what, I, what I don't understand is why it works for 50 backported commits, but it doesn't work for a merge commit. Uh, time, the effort. Okay. And light patches are also, it take, they take time to query, right? You have a thread sitting somewhere in the corner with the old Okay. So more, more patches, more time, and that's more exponential. Ops load for every light patch. Okay, all right. So I think what case, I, I, I wanted to say, just one second. I, it's actually, the flaws have categories, right? So the best is to eliminate the categories of the flaws. Uh, what you've been doing painstakingly with the uh, Clang, like compilers to eliminate, like, hey, no out of bounds here, more strong type checking. That is the actual way we get rid of some of the other. Yeah. So I'm trying to make this number go down. Yes. <laughs> and you are. You are making it down. And Russ will make it go down a little bit more. So in, in the deeply embedded space, what I mean by that is basically not Android, but real Android stuff that goes in hospitals, for example, their certification, and you cannot just change software every week. Right? So. The problem is that if there's a really serious security issue, you can pass it through the certification process, um, but you can't like let in like hundreds of changes just because they might uh, fix some flaws. So there's an issue of categorization here. Uh, uh, so yes, you can say the certification process is broken, but it's kind of the compliance discussion that was there earlier. It, it exists, it's, it's there today. So how do we deal with it? This government knows this. And they are working to solve that because they are, their security, their cybersecurity work is they're changing the laws and they're changing requirements. So, the at least the U.S. government, the EU government also understands this with the CRA, and they're going to be mandating, and they have special categories and what they must and must do, and they must be able to take updates and retain certification and quicker certification stuff. So the legal infrastructure behind that is changing. It's going to take time though. We've, we've got, excuse me, we have five minutes left. I'm wondering if we can make any action items. How, we, how are you actually going to move forward? We've, done, we've had a lot of discussion. What's, can we wrap up? Can we, uh, how, <laughs> yeah, we, well, how do we so move forward? The, the, the sort of approach that seems to be uh, the, the most reasonable one according to this discussion is let's do something <laughs> like idea one. So let's define threat models, separate ones. One for cloud providers, one for distro uh, distributors, one for, I mean, everybody gets a threat model. Who wants a threat model? Uh, and then the analysis is then to be performed based on those shared threat models. Now, where these threat models get published, how we get people to actually contribute, that I think is something that is yet to be discussed. I don't know if we can do it uh, in a, such a big room with so many opinions and so many companies and so many different use cases. But at that point, it, depends, it, it becomes a problem of the single threat models. So the cloud so people can address what, it one way. What's the next first step? Is it a mailing list? Is it an IRC channel? How, how do we now communicate and take this out of this room? Yeah. Let's do IRC, right? We, apparently, there is an IRC already existing. Yeah, but so. do, are, we, are you happy for us to take that on, take that over? Um, so the IRC channel we had, with has, which has current product security from Red Hat, SUSE, uh, uh, Fedora, Game 2 and stuff, uh, is uh, hashtag, hashtag distro-security at Libera. Uh, it's sort of an uh, open channel, not a lot of discussion happening there, but it's, I think it's a nice venue to do this. Another option is to use the OpenSSF Slack, because there is a vulnerability disclosure working group there, and it could work as a SIG. Uh, personally, I'm partial for the RC channel or a mailing list, at least. Linux Foundation had on, from a legal point of view, be very careful here. There's antitrust issues. That's why the Linux Foundation is formed. We can talk about this in public in a form of a trade organization having closed channels. You enter into monopolistic issues where the lawyers do not like. <laughs> so make sure it's done in a way that's open and collaborative and that follows course, the yeah. lawyers of our company's care. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, of course, yeah. Closed IRC channels, very good. 
but you know, it's just so, very important. So the next step is we'll try to come up, keep an eye on the mailing list Linux CV announced. We'll try to f uh, list a few IRC channels that you can join. Maybe keep it simple, kernel security, right? And the other one is uh, we, Damiano and others like at Google, there is a cloud LTS project we've been trying to get off the ground. I think there is enough shared interest in the room that that can be bootstrapped. I'll we'll share some GitHub links. Uh, Are you happy to, for that to feature creep and become <laughs> cloud and mobile and yeah, yeah, IoT sure. Sure. LTS? Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's the best name we could come up with because right. we are biased. Can we change the name? <laughs> yes, of course. We do that all the time. All right. <laughs> yeah, touche. That's true. Um, yeah, well, now there's one minute left. Uh, so does anybody have anything else that they wanted to share with the room? I think we should have CV for every syscall of us. We almost do. Okay. Uh, can, can you move it out of the way? <laughs> Every unfixed is called a bug. We yeah. Fix it. Oh, wow, yeah. 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 Good luck. Yeah, Good luck. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No. Oh, we, yes. we seem to all agree then. The goal is to address the weaknesses, right? Yeah. Okay. This is very. Uh, I'm so happy that we have company and camaraderie here. It's not alone. Yeah. yeah. This really loves company. Indeed. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone, then. It's lunch.